I know, huh? Good morning. Welcome once again to Colton Community Church. I'm so glad to, to see you all uh, this morning. Um, so many things happening around us right now. We got fires happening. We got uh, the, the temperature just baking um, and with COVID-19 and people are just going through so many things. And, you know, I'm just, just so glad that even in the midst of all the things that are happening in our world, we can come together and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, praise his name, and um, recognize him as holy. Um, even when everything else seems like it's going crazy, we know that we have a holy God who has everything under control. And we want to just acknowledge him today and, and, and recognize his greatness. So we're going to start off with a song called Holy, Holy, Holy. Would you please stand with us? Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Those are great words. And as we were singing, I was just envisioning my sin upon his shoulders. And I'm in the crowd and I'm mocking him with the other scoffers. You said. You said. And now, because I understand what he did, I sing with holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. With those words, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are holy and you are righteous and you, Lord, you took my scoffing, my sin, my doubt, my my judgment on you and you absorbed it and you did that for me so that I can have a relationship with you. Lord, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your grace, your holiness your love for us that is beyond anything we could imagine. So Lord, as we now enter this time where we look at your word and and we listen to the ancient voice of Peter, I pray, Lord, that through the echoes of time and the combination of your word and your spirit living within us, that you would speak to us so that we, Lord, could walk in a manner worthy of you And Lord, our actions would be actions that bring you praise, honor, and glory. In your wonderful name, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It is great to see you on this exceptionally hot Sunday. 
Holy moly, it's hot out there. And then, then we got Ash, little Ash, as Javon, you know, flailing through. I told Debbie before the church, hey, it's snowing outside. Isn't that great? It's just, you know, a couple of months later and it will be cold. I will remind you that, you know, December and January are coming. And so even though we're hot now, in a couple of months, you guys are going to be bundled up in a jacket and going, yay, yay, it's cold. You'll be longing for the heat, but not the super heat. All right, it is good to see you. You're ultimately going to want to get into... Um, your Bibles, open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to finish chapter 1 today, and we're going to move into chapter 2 next week. 1 Peter chapter 1. And, and let me share you a story. Actually, not a story, a letter that this man wrote. His name is Sir John Templeton. He's, he was a philanthropist. He was an investor, and he, became a, he made a bunch of money. And so he developed things, and he gave all the money away. He gave a lot of the money away. And he asked this question. And the question is, how can we get six billion people around the world to practice gratitude? Well, his, he asked that question, and he didn't have an answer for it, but, but his daughter was running through some of his stuff. He died in 2006, 2008. And after his death, his daughter was running through some of his personal effects, and she found a short Christmas letter from him. And it isn't the kind of Christmas letter that, that we're used to getting, the kind of letters that say, oh, this is what we did this year. You know, this is, this is the great things we accomplished. This is a letter kind of asking the questions. And the question that he asked was, how can we get six billion people to practice gratitude? And so this is what he wrote. He said, if you exercise no control, your mind will become a weed patch and a source of shame and misery. If you exercise wise control, then it will be filled with God's miracles in place of indescribable beauty. You are free to choose. How will you do it? How can you do it? Simply, for example, develop the habit of looking at each thought as a plant. If the plant is worthy to be put into your garden, you keep it. You cultivate it. If, if it is worthy, if it fits in your plan for your desires for your mind, you cultivate it. If it is not worthy, if it is a weed, if it's not worthy to cultivate in your thoughts, you get rid of it. So how do you get it out of your mind? You simply replace that weedy thought with two or three thoughts of love, thoughts of worship. For no mind can dwell on more than two or three thoughts at a time. And then I put up a picture of kind of a dilapidated garden because his letter continues. He says, circumstances outside of the garden of your mind do not shape you. You shape them. For example, if you expect treachery, allowing those thoughts to dwell in your mind, you will get it. If you fill your mind with thoughts of love, you will give love and you will get it. If you think little of God, he will be far from you. If you think often of God, the Holy Spirit will dwell in you more often. The glory of the universe is open to every person who asks. Some look and see. Some look and do not. Gardens are not made in a day. The thoughts of your mind are not made in a moment. God gave you one lifetime for the job. Control the garden with your mind and the wisdom that he has given you, and you will bequeath a wise garden. So, thinking about how we think, and this is what Peter says, therefore, with your minds alert and fully sober, as you think, as you think, therefore you are, as you think. And so, so our challenge today, last week, was how do we, what do we dwell on with our minds? What are we constantly fixated upon? And, and, Templeton would say, well, that's going to be the garden, and it's not going to happen overnight, but, but if you continually think and you continually dwell on thoughts of God, thoughts on worship, thoughts on what Jesus Christ will do, you will reap a bountiful harvest of, of wisdom, of righteousness, of holiness. But if you continue to think on things that you had when your desires were of the world, you will reap the worldly desires. So Peter said, and we listened to this last week, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he called you as holy, so be holy in all you do. 
For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. And since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as gold and silver, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But it was with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but has been revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, through the perfect lamb that was bought, that that was imperishable, through Jesus, you believe in God, who raised Jesus from the dead and has glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, and not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers in the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So Peter, the apostle that walked with Jesus for multiple years, Peter, the one who, one who denied Jesus and the one who, who was impulsive and said, hey, hey, Jesus, why don't we build three, temple, three tents right here and, and, and we'll dedicate this place. Peter, the one who would often put his foot in his mouth and yet Peter was the one who Jesus, the first apostle that Jesus went and saw Peter was the one that Jesus, after the resurrection, restored, showing great forgiveness. Peter then preaches the gospel and he preaches to people who are dispersed, people who are dispersed all over the area, kind of in modern day Turkey. And he's talking to people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And as they've come to faith in Jesus Christ, they need to hear some things because there's some challenges that they're facing, their culture doesn't accept the message. Their family has probably ostracized them. They're, they're, they're challenged because they believe that Jesus is the Messiah and other people believe that Caesars are God. And so what they're saying and the challenges they're facing are tough. And so, G- and so Peter has given them some accolades and say, you believed in the word of God. You believed the word that was preached to you. The two things, two major points we have is healthy minds. We need to have healthy minds. We need to constantly be planting new healthy seeds in the garden of our mind, right? We need to not be constantly planting unhealthy things in the garden of our mind because our mind only has so much real estate and what are you gonna build in that garden? And once you build the garden, once you start thinking you need to live holy, Peter is not concerned with just thinking Christian thoughts, just thinking intellectually about God. He's interested and he spends a lot of the book on the idea of how you live. What are your relationships like? And so in this passage I just read, there are five commands that he gives. Five commands. And they all have to deal with our conduct. And Peter had a contemporary, we call him the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was writing to a great church in Philippi. And the Apostle Paul says this, he says, whatever happens, he's interested in the conduct, the actions of the faith-filled followers in Philippi. That worked out well, didn't it? The faith-filled followers in Philippi? Yeah, whatever happens, Paul says, conduct yourself. Live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, conduct yourself yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence. In other words, what rumor am I going to hear about your conduct? I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. You're, you're walking with God and you're walking arm in arm with others with Christ. That's what Paul's interested in. Peter's interested in the same thing. He's interested that our conduct matches our what we think. And so the first command he gives in this text, the first imperative he uses is set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Healthy conduct brings with Jesus, oh, begins with Jesus and the hope of his return. I don't know if you're 
paying attention to what's going on in 2020, but we want Jesus to come back soon. Amen? You know, we, just see, we just see more and more destruction, more and more chaos, more and more lives being lost, more and more issues challenging our faith, and more importantly, slandering who Jesus is. And, and we just say, how long, O oh Lord? How long? How long until you tarry? How long until you come back? That's what we long for. We need to keep our eyes focused on the fact that uh, Jesus is going to return. Jesus is going to return. And, and um, so we need to th- say that because unhealthy conduct, and so we're going to contrast that. People who don't focus on the fact that Jesus is going to come back They set their hopes on evil desires you had before you became a believer. Don't set your hopes on 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 evil desires, saying, "Well, well, if 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 I just got this, if I I just obtained this, this just happened to me." The same thing that the world hopes for. Your hope is on the return of Jesus Christ, not the same evil desires that the world has. If you're a non-Christian and you're if you're a Christian and your hopes and your desires are the exact same as that of a non-Christian. What's the difference between the two of you? What is the difference? Is your hope that, well, if my bank account has enough money, then I'm satisfied? Well, the non-Christian thinks the same thing. If my hope is, well, if I am in a relationship or if I end the relationship for some people, then that's the same thing. Your hope as a believer needs to be set upon, focused and foremost on Jesus Christ and his return. There's some things that he talks about for an unhealthy. Your desires, we'll get to that in a second. Number two, the second command is as obedient children, Peter writes in verse 14, do not conform to the evil desires. Healthy conduct does not conform to the desires. In the beginning of chapter two, Peter writes this. He writes, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, the desires you, you had before you became a Christ, before you became a Christian. Sorry about that. What are they? One person is malice. What is malice? It's not a word that we use often, not a, not a word that I, I'm, I'm guilty of saying, oh, oh, hey, you're guilty of malice. Malice is sweet revenge, though. Watch a lot of movies. Movies are filled with the evil of malice. Oh, the bad guy has, the good guy, he gets hurt, and what he has to do, he spends the whole entire movie getting revenge. It is pleased when another is harmed. Our entertainment is filled with a thought of malice. Peter says deceit. Deceit is when you desperately attempt to mislead, trick, or bait someone to gain an advantage. As a believer in Jesus Christ, your life should not be filled with deceit. Trying to gain the upper hand, you're you're lying, you're deceiving so that that you can trick somebody, so that you can bait somebody into saying this, and then all of a sudden they say it and you go, nah, see, I told you. You weren't as good as you thought you were. Deceit is when you deliberately attempt to mislead somebody or to trick them or bait them. Hypocrisy, Peter says, get rid of all hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when you deliberately put on a mask to play a part. When you deliberately act in a certain way like people want you to act. When you deliberately do things that people want you to do and and you're not real, you're not honest with them. You don't simply tell the truth. You lie. You cheat in such a way, you live your life in such a way that you're two-faced. Over here you act one th- way and you do one thing and over here you act one way and you do one thing. You, you play the part. It's a theatrical term of an actor. Get rid of all hypocrisy. Get rid of all envy. Envy is where you feel displeasure at the success of one another or at another. Thus, you become resentful. Think about that. A friend of yours, you're struggling financially. A friend of yours gets a bonus at work, and you, in your heart, you feel resentful. A friend of yours maybe gets a raise, and you feel a little resentful at their getting a raise, and, it, and, yet, and yet they don't even walk with God. They go to church every now and then, and, and all of a sudden, financially, they, they, they get more money, and, and you, you, you struggle, you walk with God, you have devotions every single day, and, and why isn't God blessing you? And you feel resentment towards them. I want us to be the church that applauds the blessing of God on other people's lives. 
When I talk to other pastors and, and I hear of other pastors whose churches are doing well, you know what? I applaud that. Praise the Lord. The message of the gospel is going forth. When I hear that, that somebody else leads somebody to Jesus Christ, I praise the Lord for that. I, I love the fact that God is working in and through other members of the body of Christ. And we're not all Apollos. We're not all Peter. We're not all Paul. And, and some people God is blessed with the ability to lead others to Jesus. Some people God is blessed with the opportunity to lead larger churches you know, I'm blessed here because in here, in this church, as I get to know us, I, one, I can have a personal relationship with you all. Two, is, is I see a zeal for God's word growing more and more in God's people. That's, that's the testimony I give of what's going on in Colton Community Church. I give it that people love God's word. And they're, they're, they're studying it. They're excited about God's word. They're excited about loving it more and more. And, and that's what I'm proud of. We might not be 10,000 people large, but that doesn't mean that we'd be 10,000 people who passionately love Jesus' word, right? We could just be 10,000 people that entertain someone well. I'd much rather have a few people that love Jesus and love his word. A few people who are faith-filled followers. So, number one, healthy conduct begins with Jesus and anticipating his return. Two, healthy conduct does not conform to evil desires. Number three, your conduct is, your conduct with, oh, conduct yourself with complete holiness. We just sang, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And now Peter is telling us we need to conduct ourselves. Our actions, our attitudes, our thoughts need to be holy. Holy means set apart. It means separate, completely unique and separate. And sometimes I've used the illustration is, is when you put something aside and you got this really nice dish, you have this really beautiful plate and you put it aside, you put it in the china hutch and, and therefore it is, quote, separated. It is, it is out of the common use. And you wouldn't take that plate out of the china hutch and you wouldn't go dig a trench with it. You wouldn't put it underneath your car to collect the oil, would you? No, because that's not where that plate belongs. You, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've bowed your knee and, and you've given him your heart and the Spirit dwells within you, you are holy. God has set you apart for a noble purpose. The King of kings calls on you. The King of kings dwells upon you. He lives within you. And he has set you apart. And anything he asks you to do, therefore, is the role of a king's servant. Conduct yourself with complete holiness. He says, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Let me read you. Let me explain a passage to you. When you think of God being holy, one of the passages you probably jump to or you might jump to is Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah the prophet, the famous prophet, he has this great vision, this grandiose vision of seeing the Lord God. Imagine this. Imagine Isaiah the prophet, the vision starts and he walks into the temple in Jerusalem. And then this is, this is Solomon's temple. This is the beautiful one. This is the magnificent one. And it was probably one of the largest buildings on earth. It was probably one of the largest buildings that Isaiah has ever seen that's man-made. And so Isaiah comes into Jerusalem, into the temple, and he sees these golden pillars that rise like redwood trees to the big, tall, gold-painted ceiling. And he's just in awe. And his, and his knees get a little, wink, little weak at the spectacular facility that this is and what it represents and the light gleaming and shining and, and, and the magnificence of the building. And he's standing there and he's in awe. And he says, wow, this is great. And then, as he's standing there amongst those golden pillars in that room that is just shining and reflecting, all of a sudden, the vision gets different. And he says, wow, this is even greater. And, and, and as his knees were wobbling, pretty soon, his knees get weak and he falls flat on them because he sees 
angelic beings. He sees seraph with six wings, with two of the wings they cover their face, and with two of the wings they cover their feet, which, which is a euphemism for their private parts. They cover themselves in humility. And then they fly. And if you thought the golden pillars were amazing, imagine seeing angelic beings covering themselves in humility, moving from here to here. You've never seen anything so amazing like that. And, and, and you're feeling your mouth is dry and all of a sudden you, you, you start to get weak and you fall on your knees and they start to proclaim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and as they speak, that great pillar that is so strong starts to wiggle and the doors of the temple, they start to shudder and the walls, they start to rock and you fall on your knees in awe because while the building is great, the angelic beings are greater. And then the vision changes for Isaiah and Isaiah, Isaiah understands while these angelic beings were being humble, he understands what's going on because, because now he falls flat on his face because he says the angels and the train, he sees the Lord on his throne. And just the train of his robe, not even him, the train of his robe, the, the smallest, the least part of his whole entire outfit, it fills the temple with glory. And he's awestruck at the presence. And he says, I saw the Lord seated high and exalted. And the train of his robe, just the thinnest part of his robe, filled the temple with glory. Imagine that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That, that the magnificence of the building, you would go, wow, this is great. The, the wonder and the awe-inspiringness of the angelic beings here, there, everywhere, you would say, oh, oh, what am I doing? And then you just see the thinnest part of the train, of the robe, of the glory of God, and you fall flat on your face, and you say, woe am I. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And you realize that you are but a sinner. And in that vision, the great thing is God, God takes, and God has an angelic being get a coal and put it to the lips of Isaiah, passing on the forgiveness and commissioning Isaiah to then go and proclaim the good news. And he proclaims about the suffering servant later on in his writings. But the holiness of God. You, as people, faith-filled followers of God, be holy for the sheer reason that your God is holy. For no other reason than the God that you worship, the God that you proclaim an allegiance to, the God that you say you follow, the God that, that you say you pray to, the God who you ask questions to, the God in who you reach out to and ask for help, be holy because he is holy. He is holy. And sometimes we come to him and we forget that. Sometimes we come to him and, and we forget who he is that we're coming to and the presence that we're entering into and the relationship that the one who adopted us, called us, asks us. Do not forget that God is holy. He is holy and in his greatness. And that's why there's a fourth command. Conduct yourself as a foreigner with reverent fear. You need to conduct yourself as a foreigner in reverent fear. It says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as a foreigner here in reverent fear. In other words, don't hold tightly onto the things of the earth. Don't hold tightly onto those things that so easily, easily entangle our heart. Cause us to stumble, cause us to get into the fights, cause us to get into arguments, cause us, us distractions and desires that aren't fulfilling of the holy God. You need to conduct yourself as a foreigner here. Years ago, when Amy started an English school to Afghan refugees, and, and she started this and she made relationships with some Afghan refugees, some of them still call her today, this is probably 
10 years ago. And she realized that while, while they learn English, and that's what she wanted to teach them, while they're learning English, while, while she's trying to model for them what it means to be a faith-filled follower of Christ, they always understood this wasn't their home. They understood that home is where mom and dad live. Well, the same is true for us. While we're getting comfortable, or if you're outside in 120 degree weather while you're uncomfortable, right? <laughs> while we live here on the earth, always, always, always remember this is not our home. Today, we desire to be with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who calls us by name. Hold loosely to those things which cause us so much distractions. One person says this, and, and we do this because, what's he say? He says, live and because the Father who judges each person's work impartially. Listen to this, church. Listen to what F.B. Meyer, the commentator, says about God's judgment towards us who believe. God's children are to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Not, not whether we're going to get into heaven and have a relationship with it, but there's a judgment seat of Christ. This judgment will not decide our eternal destiny because that has already been settled. But it will settle the rewards of our faithfulness or otherwise. Your faithfulness, your Father in heaven will judge your faithfulness. And the things that are not precious, they'll get burned up. They won't last. And then those, those precious jewels, those things that last forever, you get to present them to Jesus. The good works that you've done on his behalf for him, that are truly for him. Church, we don't talk about it a lot, but what we do matters. Not just here, but it matters when we meet Jesus. So, number five. Number five, conduct yourself with a deep love for one another. Love one another. Now that you have purified yourself, now that you have been forgiven because you have obeyed the truth, the truth is this, is that Jesus Christ died for your sins. All of us, all of us have died. To, all of us are sinful. All of us have, have at one time or another cursed God. And God bears that sin and says, you're right. You're forgiven now. I forgive you. And we take Jesus and we accept him as our savior. We bow our knee. We recognize that he is holy, holy, holy. We recognize that, that the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. We recognize that he is the judge. And we see him. And now we obey him. Have love for one another. What does it say? Since you have a sincere love for each other, love one another deeply. Deeply from the heart. Don't just say, yeah, hey, yeah. you fist bump, bump one another and go, yeah, hey, love you, bro, love you. And you don't talk to the person, you don't see the person for a couple of months and, and they pass by your mind. But you need to choose to love one another deeply. They need to get under your skin. They need to get into your heart. For you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable through the living and enduring word of God, you have been born again. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says, I call you my friends and I lay down my life for you. I want you to be with me. And so he lays down his life for his friends. And after he lays down his life for his friends, he says, come and have a relationship with me. For God so loved the world, you've heard this before, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. And the next verse says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And that's our mission. Our mission is then to take that word of God, that knowledge of who he is in our lives and the word of truth that he has given us and to share that word with others and to proclaim the good news is that they too can be forgiven. They too can have a personal relationship with Christ. They too can love one another deeply. They too can be holy, can live a life that pleases God. 
And so Peter, Peter writes these little words, and, and, I, and, I, and it means this. It means life is short, so we need to keep our priorities straight. Life is short, so we need to keep our priorities straight. I was reminded how short life is on Tuesday. On Tuesday, the church had a, had a little prom- plumbing problem. And um, we had a leak out there in the, in the grass. And, and so I had ordered a part, and Mark Gibbons and I were going to replace the part. It should be pretty easy, right? It should be pretty easy. And so I get there, and Mark does what Mark always does is he's late, Rich. <laughs> the guy lives one minute away from church, and he's late. And I live 25 minutes away from church. I'm there, and Mark is late. And, and, so, and so I start to dig, and a guy named, a guy in an old beat-up white little old Toyota truck. He goes, hey, need any help? He's at the stop sign on Rancho and Laurel. And I go, no, no, I've got it. Thinking Mark, need, Mark is going to be here anytime. That's going to be help. And then, so he goes, no, no, you need help? No, I got it. And so he goes ahead and he makes an illegal right turn and he turns right here on Laurel and parks in the red zone right on Laurel. And he comes up into the grass. He's going, you need any help? I go, no, no, I've got it. He goes, I don't like to see you um, when old men are out working in the yard. Man, Andrew, Andrew, his name was Andrew, and, and so, you know, I do what all smart old men do. I give them the shovel, <laughs> right, and, and so, he, you know, he works hard, and, and um, but that's how I was reminded how life is short because to some people I'm old. <laughs> Just ask my kids, you know, they know that I'm old, and, and life is short. We need to keep our priorities straight, and we were able to, ultimately, the, we fixed the part we were supposed to, but in the process, another part broke, and a thousand dollars later, and a plumber later, it's fixed. So yeah, <laughs> just wanted to share with you the challenges of yard work, right? Yeah, Mark did show up. He he showed up like 15 minutes late. The guy, what are you doing? Okay, we could tease him about that. We should really say, Mark, you're late again. I know. And so life is short, though. You know, you realize that the older you get. You realize that life, life isn't eternity. Life, physical life, the life we have before we meet Jesus is short. I have done more than enough memorial services, more than enough funerals to know that life is short. He says people are like grass. And this is something that we in Southern California are very, very aware of. In the springtime, the hills turn this beautiful green, don't they? It looks like Ireland for like a day and a half, doesn't it? It just looks lush and green and and the grass is growing and then they turn brown, it dies. People are like grass. Life is short. And not only is is people like grass, they come and they go, but, but glory is like the flower in the field. It's beautiful. It is stunningly beautiful. The flowers you get, the, they're gorgeous and, and, and they're intricate and, and they're stunning, but they're temporary. And the same thing is with all the things that the world has to offer you, all of the beauty that the world has to offer you. That beauty is fading. That beauty is temporary. That beauty will not last. But the word of God will last forever. The word of God implanted in your heart, the word of God growing inside of you. So this morning, this morning, you need to set your minds, set your minds, focus your minds on what kind of thought you're going to put into your garden. Is it going to be, are you going to allow the weeds of despair to overtake your garden patch? Or are you slowly going to replace those weeds with good, healthy plants? Let me remind you of the five commands that um, Peter gave us. The command to set your hope upon Jesus. So when you got a, you got a thought and the thought is a bad thought, you got to start thinking about Jesus. The hope of Jesus. This is not going to go on forever. And you replace the despair thought with hopeful thought. And then, and then number two was do not conform to your evil desires. You go, well, why, why? oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm desiring something that I shouldn't desire. I'm conforming to the way of the world and I need to quit that behavior. I need to start conforming to the ways of God. And number three, I do that by recognizing how holy he is and he calls me his child. And so God, you're holy. If you're holy, I'm holy. 
You have called me, set me apart, and Lord, I need to act the part. And number four, and since I'm going to act the part, I'm going to live as a foreigner here on earth. I'm going to live as a foreigner with, with, with not knowing the language of the world, not trading and bartering in, in the ways of the world. And instead, I'm going to do number five, I'm going to love one another deeply. I am going to choose to give you my heart. I am going to choose. I'm going to choose to purposefully say, you know what, I'm going to join you in that suffering. It'd be easier for me not to. It'd be easier for me to make a phone call, make a text, but I'm going to walk with you through your journey. And I am going to love you deeply from the heart. So, have some conductive reasoning this week and forever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity we have, Lord, to think clearly about the weeds in the garden. And I ask, Lord, that you would replace those weeds with healthy plants, healthy seeds of faith, healthy words of healing, healthy actions of servanthood. Lord, and that, that our minds would be, would be filled with those things that are yours. And Heavenly Father, as we now remember you in this way where we take the cup and we take the bread and, and, and we, we remember what you've done for us, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to the body of believers to take the cup and the bread. In your name we pray, amen.